Hello, and welcome to this edition of the CSIAC podcast series. This is a multi-part series entitled C++ Models, conducted by CSIAC subject matter expert, Dr. James Fawcett. This series will explore different conceptual models underlying the C++ programming language. This particular podcast will discuss code structure. Good morning. My name is Jim Fawcett. Uh, today we're going to talk about C++ models. Um, here are a couple of dictionary definitions about models, and it reflects pretty much, you know, uh, the way we're going to uh, use models for this presentation. So, you know, a, a description that can help you understand how a system or process works. That's what we're after. Um, on my website, I developed a C++ story, a fairly detailed walk through the C++ language. And its first chapter focuses on seven uh, models that I think it, I think help uh, make uh, people understand how the language works uh, reasonably well. Uh, so nice way to start um, with the language or, you know, when you're refreshing uh, your knowledge of the language. So in this video, we're going to talk about code structure and we'll uh, pick up with some of the other models in later videos. They'll be coming soon. Uh, if you want, you can um, pull up the slides are uh, here at this link. You can just pull them up and follow along as we talk if you wish. Okay, so <clears throat> C++ is a uh, ambitious language, a, a large language. Uh, I like C++ very well. I, I've developed in C++ for many years. I started in uh, 1988. And um, uh, I've of I uh, developed code in in several different languages, and of those, C plus plus is my favorite. <clears throat> so, uh, but it is big, and um, takes a while to get your arms around. And models help us understand the language, and we'll see once we're comfortable with the models that the language is really. Uh, quite internally consistent. It's a, a very nice design. I like it. Uh, and the models help us, you know, use it effectively. So these models cover code structure, compilation, execution, use of memory, classes in the C++ object model. That one particularly uh, will be a big help um, getting your uh, mindset uh, and, um, you know, where it needs to be and templates. So, you know, what we're after is to uh, help you develop this internal mental model of what the compiler is going to do. You write a line of code, what's going to happen? So it's that, it's that uh, mindset that we're trying to, trying to uh, help you acquire. Okay, so uh, code structure. So um, we write code when we develop code. We write it in files, of course. And, uh, but as the software systems that we develop get large, and they, um, you know, a lot of them do, uh, from my website, you'll find quite a few large projects. Uh, they become hard to understand just looking at the files. Uh, so, um, in order to um, support uh, readability and maintenance, uh, we create what we call packages. Packages consist of a few files, and each package has a single purpose and documents the purpose and uh, its design in comments. So files are units of construction, and packages are units of documentation. Um, the C++ a build system doesn't know anything about packages, but it does recognize projects, and we tend to associate a project with a package. Uh, each of the packages that I develop, I almost always create a project for that package, uh, and that helps me um, in the construction process, as we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. So packages are they're just simply groups of files, one or more files, stored in a single directory, 
annotated with comments to help support understanding and test and maintenance. And, uh, uh, and the directory has a project for uh, building uh, the source code. Uh, packages, so packages are units of documentation and translation. And each one will have a Visual Studio project or, you know, uh, could be a, if you're using uh, G++, that would be G++ in a make file, perhaps. So package consists of a uh, CPP file, package name.cpp file, uh, that has a construction test main function. We'll come back to that again in the next slide. It has a header file, package name.h, so the same name, and optionally may have an interface file, I package name.h. And of course, you know, package underscore name stands for whatever name you're going to give the package. Blocking Q, for example. These parts are embedded uh, in a directory with a project file or a make file uh, that use, uh, we use that to build a construction test. And uh, it may include files from other packages. So this package may depend on other packages. And so it, there may be other files in that directory. But an alternate scheme that works well, when things get large, uh, it works a little better to build the various packages as libraries. And then when I'm working on this package that depends on, let's say, two other packages, I make a reference to the libraries for those two other packages instead of loading all their files into my uh, project directory. Uh, so again, each package is expected to implement a single responsibility and have comments that describe its operation. Okay, so let's uh, think a little bit about um, testing, construction, what I call construction co-tests. So co-test is something like um, test-driven uh, design, but um, not quite the same thing, um, but the intent is very similar. Uh, so for anything other than really simple example code, it's useful to have a test as and we want to uh, test as we go. We add a main function for every CPP file and every time we add a few lines of code, we're going to add small tests in that main, build it and execute it. So that leads to a whole uh, uh, cycle of very small uh, add, build, execute, add, build, execute cycles. Uh, and so this process allows us to find errors very quickly. If something fails, uh, there's an overwhelming probability that that failure is going to be in the last few lines of code we entered. Almost probability one. So it makes, uh, uh, saves a whole lot of time uh, finding errors and, and fixing them in your code. And, you know, uh, there's a lot of information in a um, uh, source, source code for a big design. And so you know, there are going to be initially some errors, and we need to fix them. And this is a great way to, uh, to uh, stay on top of that process and make the process as easy as possible. Uh, the main, we wrap in uh, if def uh, preprocessor directives and you know, if def and end if directives. Uh, and the idea here is that if we define test underscore name, where the name is the name of the package, uh, we'll uh, compile that main and we can run it and observe what happens. Uh, you know, it's part of our construction test. Uh, when we're done with a uh, package, when we think it's uh, complete, um, uh, we can run it without defining test underscore name. And now it, the compiler won't build that main. So now we can, uh, we can uh, uh, combine this package with other packages to build a bigger executable. You know, an executable can only have one main. So if we put mains in every one of these packages, which I do, then they need to be turned off. All but one of them need to be turned off. And we do that simply by not defining test underscore package name. It's a really simple process and it works well. Okay, so uh, let's talk about code structure. So uh, here's a little example I put together that has uh, three packages, an executive package, a component A package, and a component B package. And I'm showing here the files for those packages and their pound include uh, paths. So executive includes 
uh, I component A dot H and component B dot H and component A dot H includes this uh, header file and component A dot CVP includes this header file. So, uh, and the same for component B. Now, let's think a little bit about the structure. This is an interface and um, component A dot H is a header file that declares uh, a class or one or more classes for component A and component A CVP implements those uh, classes by uh, providing code for its methods. Uh, and the same thing is true of uh, component B. Uh, so uh, there's a very, very typical structure. So um, we have um, an executive that, that orchestrates the processing flow, and we have some packages that uh, some of them may need to talk back and forth, and so we're trying to illustrate how that works with exa this example. And there's example code in the uh, repositories in this uh, CPP story repository, and you'll find code for this along with lots of other code. Uh, you'll see if you look at it that there's almost no functionality in this demo. What we're trying to do, we've uh, stripped away all the operational stuff, and all we're trying to do is illustrate how they the pieces come together, how uh, they form, uh, how we can form a composite entity out of these separate packages. So uh, let's take a look at this. So this will give us a little better idea. So these are the classes that are embedded inside that package. And so uh, in component A, we have an interface component and uh, the component itself. So this is the components interface and the component itself. Here's an executive class. Here's a component B class and a component B class uses a helper class. Uh, and this note, let's talk a little bit about this notation. So this uh, triangle says that component A is implementing this interface. So the interface declares a contract for the component, but doesn't provide any of the definition. All those definitions are in component A, and there's a reason for doing that. We'll get into just a, in just a minute. And uh, uh, this is a composition. So executive composes component B, that means component B, an instance of component B is a, um, a data member of, a, of the executive class, and the helper class is an, uh, an instance of the helper class is a member, data member of component B. These are very strong ownership rules, um, ownership relationships. Uh, what that means is that when executive is constructed, its constructor, as its first action, invokes the constructor of component B, and component B's first action, is the first action of its constructor, is to construct helper. So all of this happens as a unit. When executive is constructed, all these parts are constructed. Uh, so this is very strong. These are, uh, component B is an indelible part of executive A. Now these hollow diamonds, this is a different relationship. This is a relationship called aggregation. This is composition, this is aggregation. Aggregation is a weaker ownership relationship. It says when executive is constructed, uh, there isn't an existing uh, component A yet. Uh, the executive will create an instance of compo component A if and when it needs it. May never need it, never construct it. And the same for component B. Uh, typically that means that an instance of component A resides on the native heap and component B and executive hold um, uh, references to that uh, object on the heap. And these are these will be smart pointers, um, standard unique pointers are very typical uh, that give the executive and component uh, B access to component A. Now, the important thing is that these guys get access to the interface not to the implementation details. Now, in truth, component B, for example, that pointer binds to a component A object, but it's typed as an interface I component A, meaning component B can only do the things that this contract specifies, and it doesn't see any of those implementation details of component A. 
There's one other little bit of that recipe, and that is that this component A interface declares a factory function that executive and component B uh, will call to create an instance. And in component A's implementation, after, uh, after the component A class is declared, this class, then the uh, factory function is implemented. It has to, it has to the, that implementation has to see the declaration of the component A class before uh, it will compile. But, um, you know, that, so that organization, the, the interface has a declaration for the factory function and the component A um, defines the uh, factory function after it's defined its primary class, the class that the factory function is going to create. Okay, so uh, one thing we might mention is that C++, I talked about this as an interface, C++ doesn't have an interface construct. Uh, C Sharp and Java do. Uh, C++ doesn't, but we use structs uh, with functions with no definitions. They're called pure virtual functions. Uh, uh, and um, uh, that struct with pure virtual functions plays exactly the same role as an interface does in C Sharp or Java. It works very well. Uh, okay, so, so here's a little bit about um, those, uh, what's in that interface. You know, if we look at this component A, it has no implementation. What the, what the executive and the component B see, they see this uh, struct declaration, the declaration of the uh, contract, uh, the interface, and it sees a function uh, equals zero, says this is a pure virtual function. It says this, uh, this interface is not going to implement this function. Uh, it's implemented um, by uh, any class that implements the interface. And here is a declaration of a factory function, create component. So what's going to happen when we call create component? We're going to get back a smart pointer pointing to a concrete component on the, um, in a native heap, but it's typed as an interface, meaning this pointer can only call functions defined in this interface uh, and it, uh, and this has no information. As you can see, there's no information about what classes implement this, you know, what are their details? None of that information is here. And that means that the executive and component B are, have a very strong isolation from the details of component A. So we can change component A all we want, as long as we don't change the interface and the uh, declaration of the factory function, uh, executive and component B uh, build just fine. No matter how we change this, they'll build just fine uh, because they've been isolated from the details of component A. That turns out to be a very, very important uh, uh, thing that um, software developers do. Um, one, of the, one of the problems with large systems is that they tend to get creeping dependencies that make things hard to manage. And by using these interfaces, we break those dependencies. Now, you know, the, these other parts depend on an invariant interface. They don't depend on this thing that's changing. So every time we change this, we don't have to go and change these guys because they depend on that invariant interface. One last uh, comment before we uh, finish. Uh, there's actually a couple of kinds of um, interface um, um, factory functions. Uh, so this is the kind we used in this demo. We return a unique pointer, you know, typed as an interface, and that's pointing to a, a concrete instance on the managed heap. But we could also build a singleton factory that returns a C++ reference to a static uh, uh, instance, uh, and that would probably be in the stack. Uh, somewhere, but it's a static, you know, so the instance itself is, uh, sits in static memory, and we'll hear, you know, we'll discover that that means that that instance will live for the duration of the program. Uh, we'll see that when we talk about uh, our memory model. So anyway, um, uh, that's uh, the idea. Uh, interfaces, uh, let me, so let's hide this um, uh, panel so you can see this. So 
Uh, so uh, the executive and the component B are isolated from these guys and that comes because we have a interface and we have a factory function. Uh, so this was all just a very trivial, you know, do, do very little kind of demo, just to show you, you can look at the code, it's simple, and see how things are glued together. Uh, there's a more realistic example in this repository. I built a, a logger that I'll be using uh, in lots of testing in the repository. And this logger uses uh, both, actually implements both of these kinds of factory functions so that a user to be a logger uh, can either have a singleton instance he shares with other uh, parts of the program, or it has one that he's just using now. All right, uh, in the next video, we'll talk about C++ comp uh, compilation models. And um, uh, so uh, I uh, thank you for your attention, and uh, maybe we'll see you again in one of the subsequent videos, and with that, we'll say uh, goodbye. On behalf of the CSIAC, we would like to thank you for viewing this podcast. We hope you found the content informative and useful. If you would like to provide feedback or comments, please visit our website at www.csiac.org, where you can also find additional content to review. Thank you.